Hello. 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 Is this working? I, I think. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Just, just a second here. Hold on. There, there we go. I think that, I think that we got it fixed. All right, this is Hyper Boring Radio. I am so glad everybody made it today. Uh, I'm really hoping everybody's enjoying the 4th of July. This is Celtic God, and with me is the Lord Keeper. Well, hello to everybody out there on the wastelands of modernity. Uh, today we're going to be talking about American mythology, as well as the traditions of Midsummer. So I think it's going to be a good talk, and I hope everyone's having a good Independence Day. And if you're not from America and you don't have the 4th of July, well, look on the calendar. It is there, I promise. You probably just don't have the Independence Day part. But that's why we're going to also talk about Midsummer. And this is just one of, many, um, one of many celebrations that we have. I hope everybody's been following our Telegram and is listening to our podcast because we record two separate shows every week one goes here on youtube which is let's say family friendly or at least we try try our best to keep it that way and the other one is less so which we put up on our podcast by the same name hyperborean radio we're everywhere and um, we also post direct links to that in the telegram as well as just so much lore and um, yes, we have to remember on YouTube to say, don't forget to subscribe, share us, like us, and hit the notification bell so you can be updated with every upload that we do. Wow, that was so hard to do. <laughs> We're not very great at self-promotion if it wasn't obvious already. But. I am myself an American, and so is CG. Uh, he's a Uper. I'm an Iowan. And, yeah, 4th of July has a lot of obvious American symbolism with it. And it also carried over a lot of traditions from Midsummer. It's sort of the closest thing in America, you could say, to a Midsummer celebration. Uh, the sparklers actually are a continuation of these like burning sticks or burning brooms that people used to chase each other with. Oh yeah, I wanted to bring that up because um, there's some places in America where Juneteenth was a welcome celebration in every city far and wide across America with parades and marches and all this good stuff. However, on the verse side, there are many places that are also canceling the 4th of July. So, um, that's what um, the Lord Keeper was just getting into, is that there's some ancient traditions, actually, that go with celebrations uh, for Midsummer, which include the brooms, which I had heard of that before. He, he did a, um, a really cool post on it on our Telegram recently. I believe it was on Telegram, or was it on the website? And the website's name, by the way, is wilderhomesproject.life. We'll try to remember to put that into the description. So if you haven't seen that, you can go there. We put blog posts on there that does not go up on the Telegram. Usually they're far, far bigger, which is why why they go there. And you can also follow the podcast on there. You go to the theater tab, and the podcast is sitting right up top. And there is some music donated to the people um, by... Trova de Lid, that's our friend Alex. So thank you, Alex. We really do appreciate it. And to continue on with some of the really cool um, celebration, or yeah, the celebration things, I guess, is what they would be, that, that broom that he was talking about. So uh, yes, I'll let the lore keeper continue telling us about that. Well, and like you've actually spoken about it because like I grew up with sprinklers. I didn't have, you know, burning sticks or anything like that. But like when up the, in the UP where you're from, you've actually told me like you've seen people who will get the sticks on fire and they'll basically use them just like sprinklers. They chase each other around with it. Uh, they will write stuff in the air just like people tend to do with sprinklers, uh, sparklers, different thing. Sprinklers and sparklers. 
opposite elements. Opposite elements. One is water, one is fire. Um, and then fireworks are also a continuous old uh, tradition. There's, they're involved in wilderman customs. They're involved in uh, midsummer. They were them and uh, gunfire, I believe it was, was employed to keep sort of the more malicious spirits at bay or however people choose to word it because it's kind of a whole thing. But uh, before that, more than likely what we did was we just put accelerants on uh, on bonfires like people are like to do. Oh, hey, gasoline, just pour it. Yeah, that's all I was going to say is that still goes on today. If you got a bonfire and white people and some kind of fuel, whether it's oil or gasoline or just some old pine boughs, the fire starts to die down a little bit. On go these things because you get that big rush of light and fire and heat. And with the pine boughs, you get the sparks. So uh, I've seen people take the brooms or sticks and just beat a fire to make the sparks go up in the air. At night, it's really pretty. It's it's kind of cool and it's fun. Um, you can see it as chasing away evil spirits or you can just see it as fun. And either one is just fine with me. Well, and that's kind of the thing is most traditions have a functional and entertaining and a metaphysical, I guess you could say, aspect to them. It's like uh, the eternal flame. There's the aspect of, you know, veneration of a hearth goddess, whether that's Vesta, Hestia, Brigid. Or there's on the other side, there's the utility of it's easier to light a fire when you need it if you already have fire. Well, and two, with the fire, if you have a large enough community, what you end up with, and this just happens pretty natural, naturally if you have a big enough gathering, you end up with a central fire, which is usually the biggest one, and then it's it's the craziest thing, and we just seem to do it. I, uh, um, celebrations I've been directly involved with and then ones I just showed up for, you end up with a... a central large bonfire and then rings of smaller fires around the outside edge of that fire and if i've seen that i've seen celebrations have been celebrations big enough where there was you had the central fire and then two concentric rings of fires around the large central one which was massive and yeah it's, it's just fun and then everybody playing and having fun and running back and forth to the different fires and really, yeah, we would still do that today pretty much if we was allowed to. Because in some areas where you don't get in trouble for doing that, guess what they still do? That's why I'm aware of it is because it's, it does still happen. Well, and like myself, I went to, back when I was in Iowa, my dad and my brother and I went to a July 4th. It was, I think it was July 3rd, but they, when it hit like nighttime, like midnight, basically, they set off the fireworks for 4th of July, but it was actually great. Like there was a bunch of American folk music. Uh, it was on like an old stand in the middle of the woods and there was a hill with like a bunch of logs that people were sitting on and that's where people would watch the music and then they'd go hang out with friends, play cornhole or any other game that was going around, go get barbecue. There was some barbecue places and then... The piece de resistance after all these folk music and these games and everyone just hanging around having a good time. Uh, my, uh, what happened was they got all these flags and they burned them. And before anybody loses a gasket, that's the appropriate way to retire a flag when it's too damaged to keep flying is actually to burn it. And they had people come in and they all were playing bagpipes and you know people saluted. And one thing I want to bring up really quick in regards to because I've been racking my brain what sort because I'm someone who subscribes to the idea that a lot of this stuff is instinctive and you can kind of notice it and I've been trying to figure out what replaced the sort of midsummer pole and I, it just hit me it's it's the flagpole the American flag pole has replaced the midsummer pole in the July 4th celebrations Right, I was just going to ask you if with the flag burning, did they do the whole ceremony where it was folded and they burn them that way? Or was it, uh, you know, we put them on a, uh, we light them on fire and then stamp them on the ground like they do today at so many of these 
We'll delicately call them celebrations. Uh, it was actually a, uh, what they had was they had like a wire pole, like not a pole, but like, um, it was at like 18, 20 feet tall. And the flags were basically hung on what was a wire construction. And they did have like some that were folded and put on there gingerly. And then it was this huge bonfire. And, you know, people were playing, um, I think it was Danny Boy on bagpipes. And there were just all these people, you know, paying respects and everyone had a good time. And it was, it was great, actually. Right. And as far as a midsummer pole goes, what I've seen personally is flagpoles um, with ropes hooked to it. And then the kids would, would play with it and basically do like the maypole dance, except for minus the dance part. Or as shameful as this might sound, a, a tetherball pole. And then they would just go play around the pole. I've, I've seen it done a few different ways, at a few different celebrations. But, yeah, the the would it be great if it was this great, important wooden thing that was put up? Yeah, that'd be, that'd be amazing. But one of the amazing things about our people is we use what we have. And I love that about us. Well, and it's actually something I'd like to get into because there's all these customs that turn over and everyone knows, you know, the Christmas tree, everyone knows the jack-o'-lanterns, everyone knows these different aspects that are blatantly, blatantly from European pagan customs. Um, but one person brought it up and I can't for the life of me remember what his name is. Uh, I think he's the editor-in-chief or the owner or what have you of uh, Counterkurt's Publishing. Um, I forgot his name, but he actually brought up um, a while ago that people most likely will not be returning to Christianity and they most likely will not be trying to resurrect paganism. What he was bringing up was this idea that people should do what he referred to as a civil religion, which was basically, you know, the founding father, basically the American culture as the new religion. And to a certain extent, he was correct. But what he mistook was he didn't understand what he was talking about was a, something sociologists had noticed. Um, which was people's, you know, treating the founding fathers, um, the Constitution, and all these American concepts as uh, something akin to a civil religion. But what is actually going on is people have made these localized myths, or they've created, uh, or uh, discovered, or what have you, or ascended these um, mythic figures within American mythology, and we have our own concepts of them. And there's this unique flavor to America that then gets compartmentalized into like the Cajun, uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch and all these other smaller groups in America. Right. And that, that brings me to another important topic, I guess, is a lot of people think that we need to do things in a extremely structured way. Everybody does exactly the same thing in exactly the same order. And they say the same words in the same order and they think the same thoughts the same way. And really our people don't need this because I'm, I'm roughly um, familiar with what you was just talking about. And that's one of the things that they brought up is every region has its own way of doing this, that, that quote unquote civil religion. So they didn't realize it, but what they was talking about was all the people going back, back to mean and returning to their bio spirits. Except for they was proposing that this be wrapped around the American mythology, which in America for sure would be part of it. But in Belgium, it would have Belgium myth, uh, uh, mythology wrapped, wrapped around it. And then within that, the small towns, same way with Norway or France or Germany or England and fill, Canada, fill in all the countries where we live at. And this is what we're going to return to is what we will end up if we're left alone we will end up returning to our bio spirit and yes local stories possibly national stories um that'll end up getting wrapped into it some of the the, the world war one and world war two will end up getting wrapped up into it but it's going to be different it's going to have slightly different variations from town to town area to area even right down to home to home. Well, and we brought most of the legends that we still had over here. I mean, I think there's even like some localized legends of like Finn McCool in Texas. Um, there's specific uh, 
communities of like the Wens or the Dutch or the Scandinavians, and you have these localized versions of the cultures. And I brought up, you know, the most notable ones, which is like the Cajuns from the French and the Pennsylvania Dutch from the Continental Germanics. But they're all over the place. And some of them are a bit like the Youpers, where you're from. The Youpers are a very distinct group, or at least they were before, you know, modernity got to them. But it's something that's really obvious. And I think that it's something that people tend to ignore to an extent because we almost feel guilty about the Americanness of ourselves. And I think this is, from my personal opinion, a little unhealthy because it's ignoring, you know, upwards in some cases of 500 plus years of personal history for some of ancestors that had lived. And there's entire countries in Europe that are way younger than America. There's uh, like Iceland is older than America, the country, but it's only about a thousand years old from when people got there. And it's a continuation of other European cultures and it became its own distinct thing. Yeah. And really that, that thousand years, it depends on which histories you're going by because different histories will start counting it from different times. So yeah, give or take 500 years. I mean, really that, and maybe even further than that, uh, do you want to count the Clovis people? which they found Clo Clovis, um, which is a Stone Age people. Um, they found some artifacts in Iceland from then. And, yeah, so older, 10,000 years. It, it depends on how you want to count the history. So there is that. And a lot of these celebrations, they still go on everywhere. And we're Americans, so we're going to fo focus on the American aspect. And as always, we're Hyperboreans. So we focus on it from the Hyperborean perspective as well. So even if, but however, I can't stress it enough. Even if you're not American, you can still celebrate a midsummer midsummer celebration with us um, on the Fourth of July. So today, um, yeah, anywhere in the world, and just recognize it as a midsummer celebration. Well, and most European holidays tend to go on for a few weeks. So midsummer officially, I think, depends on where you're at and what your calendar says. But it's usually like 20 to like 24, sometime around there for the summer solstice. I think if you go by St. John's Day, uh, which is what a lot of midsummer celebrations ended up getting named under Christianity, uh, I think it's fixed on like the 23rd or 24th, maybe the 25th. Um, well, and... Uh, oh. As you mentioned, Europeans, we have a tendency to celebrate for more than one day. Usually it's it's a season with many games, days, all this good stuff wrapped up inside. But as any American knows, the 4th of July is more than just the 4th of July. We even have a name for it. We call it 4th of July weekend. It doesn't matter what day the 4th of July is on. We are celebrating for a whole weekend. And why? Because we can. Really, we don't need any more reason than that. Well, exactly. And what I was getting into myself at the very least was, let's say it starts on the 20th. Paul Bunyan Day uh, in America calendar is about the 28th. So, and then a week from that, you have the 4th. So you have kind of the official solstice, kind of this midway point of this famous uh, mythic hero in America and then July 4th, and it actually falls really neatly in this two-week period. So that's kind of how I tend to do it, and for better or worse, because I grew up in America, Midsummer has this very American feel to me, uh, and it kind of reminds me of the concept of a summer romance, because Midsummer, before Valentine's Day, and I think this is partly why Valentine's Day is kind of iffy for people, like, they, they want to do it because they feel like there needs to be a day for lovers. But people are kind of like, eh, maybe Valentine's Day. Um, Midsummer throughout Europe had fertility and romance aspects up the wazoo. That's what, like, the um, the flower crowns were. Is they the women would actually, in many cases, give them to the men. 
And then if the men like them back, they might return it. They do fortune telling, all those, you know, folk magic things. Right. And guys, it's not like you get out of having to wear a funny hat, too. Because I've, and this is uh, historical. I've seen it in, as leftovers in some American celebrations. Uh, a lot of times the guys will end up wearing tree branches of some kind. Not entire eight foot sections but usually about 12 to 24 inches long and strap them to their head like their antlers, leaves and all. So, nope, you get to wear silly hats too if you want. It's not just the girls. Well, and I recommend if a guy's going to do that, do it yourself because your, uh, your woman, and this is on the chance you have a woman because the whole point of some of these celebrations is for people to pair up. So you might not you might not even have someone, um, but don't let her do it, because she'll either make it too pretty or she'll make it too big. So I would recommend if you want it to look masculine, you get a hold of it yourself. Right, because um, we was watching a music video, and um, the the girls' head wreaths very very pretty. So were the men's, except for they weren't pretty made out oak leaves and they managed to make them look like instead of wreaths like big doofy green wigs not like a noble trailing cloak that they had up over their head or a a crown of oak leaves which would have been cool but no they look more like clown wigs made out of oak leaves so guys don't let the women do that same as Here's a tip for all the fellas out there. Never let your woman zip up your zipper. Yes. Um, <laughs> but one of the great things about both July 4th and Midsummer is a lot of people tend to have fires, whether that's grilling, whether that's a camp out, whether that's picnicking, whether that's going to the beach, whether that's you know sitting around a fire waiting for the fireworks at like your local, I don't know, baseball field soccer field i mean it's different everywhere and it tends to be localized like i'm sure like we're we're in michigan but we're not right next to the lake i'm sure communities on that are right on the lake will typically end up on the beach or something like that oh yeah there's a community in the up Gramaray. Uh, a lot of people love to go there from the up uh, at least within the region like they'll they'll travel some miles to get there and a lot of the people will go in on the fireworks and they so they go there for this the celebration it's just a small town on on uh, the coast of of lake superior there's a little inlet there anyways i'm not going to give you the whole history of it but what they end up doing and the the population of this town for one day and it's celebrated all weekend so the population grows steadily right up until the big burst with the, the fireworks and everything. But by the the peak, the population of this town will increase by like a thousand times. It is a massive celebration, or at least it was a massive celebration in the UP. And they did fireworks. They would set up two or three um, stages and people would go, they would usually hire one or two bands to, that was their main job to play. And then, regular people in between the sets would just jump up there with their guitars or their drum or just start singing and blaring out with everybody. Lots of fun. Um, they bring in fire trucks from another town and there'd be fire truck wars, I guess you could call it, where you got teams teams set up with the, the fire trucks and they're blasting each other with the hoses and uh, basically trying to knock each other off their feet. Uh, so all kinds of games snowmobiles racing across the inlet so snowmobile races in july on july yeah in july i'd say on july 4th but it's not always celebrated on july 4th sometimes it's the second sometimes it's the third sometimes it's the fifth but it will be a whole weekend of this celebration and yes there's drinking um there's food there's music all these things that I say every good pagan celebration needs, people, fire, music, food, games, dancing, males, females, children. It makes it fun as long as everybody is willing to have fun. 
Well, and that's that's kind of the whole thing. And one of the reasons that I tend to not push ritual is looking at the European folk customs. What I guess you could term ritual tends to be a community experience. Like, if I had a one-person Krampus run, I would just get arrested for harassing people. <laughs> yes. Somebody out there needs to do a one-person Krampus run and let us know how it works out. <laughs> <laughs> Full-on costume with the switch and just run around switching people. I'm pretty sure, yes, it'll probably end in many, many assault charges, so don't do that. It, it. <laughs> but, man, it would be great. Um, and, really, it'd be awesome if things like that was pushed in, in communities and areas and regions and be like, hey, this is our festival. You're, wel you're welcome to come, but these are some of the things that happen, and I hope that you guys have fun with it because, really, that's what it's all about. It's about getting together as communities, building connections and, and I guess trust with each other and having fun, having fun. There's nothing wrong with having some fun. Precisely. And what I was getting to there is make sure you're having fun. Make sure you're spending time with the people you care about. If ritual means something to you, go ahead and do it. But at least on my end, if I don't have a community that I'm celebrating with, even if I barely know most of the people there, like the July 4th celebration I mentioned earlier with the live music and the barbecue, I didn't really know like more than like five people there, and I still had a good time. Um, but it's this whole... Most traditions in Europe are very rarely done alone. There's certain rites of passage or something, but even that is usually officiated to a certain extent. There's someone there to help you through it. And I think that that's one of the main things is people need to have other people. And that's where a lot of these celebrations come into play. And I've been meaning to get into this somehow, but I'm trying to find a good edgeway, so I'm just going to force it. Um, which is, there's a lot of stories in American folklore, and they used to be extremely popular. Uh, Johnny Appleseed, Paul Bunyan, Joe McGarrick, uh, Casey Jones, uh, let's see, Storm Along, Davy Jones, all these figures. Remember the Alamo. Yeah, where two, not just one, but two folk heroes died. Defend more, more but two really famous ones with uh, uh, Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. Bo uh, I don't know if both of them fought a bear, but one of them definitely did, and he had like this weird berserker aspect to his personality. Davy, Davy Crockett. You remember that song now? Yes. But it, it's this whole thing, and you can find these parallels in American mythology to European mythology all over the place. And of course, there's the parts that came over. I mean, we have a statue of we have multiple, actually, really big statues of uh, Columbia, Lady Liberty, uh, the Roman goddess Libertas, whatever you want to call her. Uh, there's a huge one on top of the Capitol building. Uh, there's Lady, the Statue of Liberty, one of the most famous landmarks in America. It's in New Jersey. Sorry, New Yorkers. It's just in New Jersey. <laughs> but um, flexing my American geography lessons. It's on Staten Island, correct? I do not know. I have honestly never put in enough effort to learn the exact geography of New York City. Well, since I'm unsure and I'm not going to cheat and look it up so I can sound smarter than I am, if I'm, if I'm correct or wrong, let me know down in the comments because we do read them. And um, yeah, if, there's, if we miss any big celebrations like this, or for things that people might do locally, let us know in the comment section. We're really interested in how these things are celebrated everywhere, not just in America. And yes, we're, we're focused on 4th of July right now, but what local celebrations are still done anywhere for a summer celebration in this rough time of the year? It doesn't have to be July 4th. It could be, I don't know, 
July 12th or June 30th, it doesn't matter. But what kinds of things are done in your guys' areas? We'd love to know. Well, like for instance, just to go off of that, when I was growing up in Iowa, you know, you have camp things. You know, most kids, because in America, we don't, we have several months off of school in the summer. I know this isn't the case everywhere, but in America, it's the case almost across the board. Um, people tend to go to summer camps uh, during that time. Not everybody, and it's been declining, at least as far as I can tell. Um, but there's a lot of those stereotypical like camp contests, and there's all these movies that have created. I did, I never went to a camp that was like this, where it was actually a sleepaway camp. I went to like a day camp when I was younger, but sleepaway camp isn't that a horror movie i think this is why the camping i guess the the summer camps have been on the decline is well the woods are dangerous and it's it's dirty and somebody's going to get a nick and then they're going to die of hy- uh, of a hypoglycemia or something uh, i mean they get absolutely ridiculous and then there's so many horror movies around summer camp and it's not just the movies it's just stories and really yeah it's it's sad but a lot of people are letting fear rule their lives which is kind of interesting because one of the traditions at camps was horror stories ghost stories and usually you'd set them in this very camp and that that was really common in this very camp Behind that tree that you're sitting in front of. <laughs> you know, where, where you got the flashlight and the fire. And then the person that you point at a tree sitting behind them, all of a sudden they get nervous. And from the cabin over there behind you. And then all of a sudden you got everybody starting to look over their shoulders at the dark behind them. And this used to be fun. Now people get PTSD and wet themselves. For shame. But it, it's a lot of these traditions that were largely centered around midsummer, and I'm sure in Europe they weren't just centered around a single holiday, but it's almost like it got separated into multiple pieces because there's also like state fairs. Right. Well, and I know in America, a lot of these things, they incorporate corn. And why? Because at later periods, corn became corn or maize is the proper term but that became one of the major crops and before that we had things in common with europe with the the bundles that we used which would be like um i don't know wheat barley rye things like that and granted midsummer you're not using much of that so usually it'd be like hay because i've seen a lot of hay used in celebrations like this and, and also throwing on fires as a matter of fact why to make it spark and go woof Well, and honestly, uh, from the American perspective, as iconic as maize is, it's a crap crop. I know some people really like it. They li- and I, I'll, I'll admit, I like a good cornbread. I like a good hush puppy. Um, You're a monster. Or uh, I think I've had good succotash once, but I've never been to New England. So maybe it's better there. Um, but... We, yeah, we used to... Uh, everyone likes to say, like, America's just always grown maize. No, we, we used to grow proper European crops in a lot more frequency. Well, part of what caused the Great Dust Bowl was the forced growth of... I think it was barley. It was part of the Homesteading Act. If you was going to move out west and, and get a homestead, which... Some states you still had to pay for, other ones you didn't, but you got a ma- massive discount. Build, anyways, you had to grow. I believe it was barley, and when you have everybody everywhere growing barley, and the reason why they was doing that is because it was a cash crop. It was a cash crop. So if you're going to have a homestead, you didn't even have a choice. You had to grow barley, which then led into this other mess that we're dealing with now. So they basically went from one kind of monocropping to another kind of monocropping. And I've tasted both uh, corn and barley. Barley does taste better. Um, 
But it's one of those things. And actually, you bring up like the Homestead Act and all these requirements uh, that people that would go out to these areas would have. And that actually brings to mind uh, Johnny Appleseed. Because Johnny, a lot of people think he planted sweet apples. What he did was he planted cider apples because he did not plant via grafting. So there was no guarantee. So almost always it's going to end up being a cider apple. And they didn't even always taste good because he, ba he would go to cider mills. He would get the seeds and he would take them out and he would plant all these apples. And largely, pretty much every apple in America is associated with Johnny Appleseed. Like there's wild apples out in Montana that are generally associated with Johnny Appleseed, even though he never made it that far west. Well, really, there's there's apple uh, apple trees and usually they're wild apple trees are associated with Johnny Appleseed from the east coast so far as i know all the way over to washington the state not the not the capital but all the way over to the west coast in washington i think that there's some uh, some apple trees over there associated with johnny appleseed and again he didn't make it that far but that doesn't matter well i mean there's even um it's not well known but like there was a folk tale you heard growing up in the up about when johnny was about to die and he knew his uh his task was unfinished. Um, he would actually, very sad. yeah, he b plants the tree and then he bends it so that the apples will fall to the ground and basically the seeds will keep spreading apple tree to apple tree. Well, you got it mostly right. He was old and he was going to die and he was sleeping under an apple tree because he was revisiting the area because the local lore is as he went further out west. But he loved the UP so much, <laughs> he came back. And and we even uh, in the UP there's even some some local lore I guess like you'll hear stories about where he crossed the straits went up into into Canada and around over that way came back down in through I believe it's Minnesota and then continue his journey out west but before he died <laughs> and it's odd I'm I'm actually getting emotional about it <laughs> but yeah he comes back to the UP. And under one of the apple trees they had planted decades before. And he's really old and he's dying and he knows it. And he takes one of the boughs and pulls it down and buries it so that another tree might come up. It had nothing to do with the apples dropping. Because if you do that with an apple tree, it, it'll actually start another apple tree right there. It, the, the branches will turn into roots and then drive up another trunk. So you can actually plant apple seeds that, or not apple seeds, apple trees that way. Uh, once the, the boughs are big enough, of course, if you can pull them down and get dirt on top of them enough that they stay planted effectively, yeah, another tree will grow. Um, and I think that might actually be one of the precursors to the grafting method. Well, grafting actually did exist before... Uh Johnny Appleseed, but yeah, that was probably one way that it was done. And we've gone over this before in uh, in Europe that sacred groves were a thing, and more than likely there might have been a shrine or some popular object or something important to the cult of that area, like I don't know an idol or something. But that's not always guaranteed. Most of the times, it was pretty much just forests at a grove that was usually sacred. And these were often probably burial grounds or maybe even in some cases just on the edge of like tree villages. Right. And I, uh, cult is the right word. However, thanks to modern media, it does have the wrong connotation. So group, I, I think really the group in the area is probably more accurate to the reality of it. You say, cult unfortunately people get the this notion of people in robes carrying books and fancy candles and singing hymns and then slaughtering their children no <laughs> not that um but there were definitely groups that would find certain things uh, certain areas important for a wide variety of areas and celebrate it in a wide variety of ways. And some might have war at certain points, might have war, you know, the fancy robes and had a book. And whether they could read it or not, it doesn't matter because it looks impressive. Well, and in America, we have this to a certain extent. Um, I mean, frick, there was like this weird rich people. 
this was actually a cult, I think it was, in the modern sense. But they had a sacred grove out in California, but I won't get into that because that's an entirely different subject. But we have, you know, state parks, which we defend. I mean, it's there's even a quote from um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, something along the lines of, like, a grove of redwoods should be treated as sacredly and as important as the be most beautiful, um, not chapel, not steeple, um, cathedral should be treated as the most beautiful cathedral. And I'm paraphrasing there, but, and that was how you get things like Yellowstone and Yosemite. And there's all these, uh, trees that are extremely important in North America. There's the angel Oak, which I forget where that was, but it's somewhere. Um, there's also Methuselah, which yes, biblical figure, but it's the oldest, uh, bristlecone pine. They've actually hidden where it is to avoid anybody potentially damaging it. And then you have like General Sherman and all these redwoods. I'm just wondering how you hide a giant tree. Oh, wait, I know how you do it. You don't bury it. You don't put a building around it. You just don't tell anybody where it's at. Well, in Bristol Cold Cone Pines are odd because they don't get huge. Like they don't get huge like an oak tree would or a redwood. Uh, what? They get like weirdly twisted. They almost look like something that's like locking up a dark lord in like a fantasy. <laughs> like if you don't believe me, look up a bristlecone pine. Tell me that doesn't look like if just the right amount of like lighting was applied, that that's not where like some sort of dark lord from like an 80s fantasy movie is hiding. It's exactly what they look like. Uh, but that's a whole thing. And people do it to this day. I mean, uh, there used to be an apple orchard back where I think there still is uh, back where I used to live. And I actually went there, I tried to go there at least once per year because there were pumpkins growing, there was a river, and there was just row after row of apple tree. Like, you could look this way, and it was just basically a giant orchard of apples. You could go through and pick them. Right, and talking about orchards, or talking about apple trees, that makes me think of, of orchards. That makes me also think of cider, because they were mostly cider apples, uh, which was turned into hard cider, which is a type of alcoholic beverage, which then brings us brings my mind to the um what's that called where they 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 outlawed alcohol prohibition. prohibition which then they chopped down most of the cider trees but why was the apple cider so important so that we could drink it at celebrations so that we could enjoy bad musicians well yeah apple cider used to be a really big thing in america um now i if you were asked what like the quintessential american alcoholic beverage is uh, you'll either get something along the lines of Budweiser, because I think that's like the most popular one, or Jack, but um, the uh, bourbon, Bur Bur bourbon and whiskey, or Jack, as you call it, which is interesting, because Jack is the name for a spirit, and what is alcohol but a spirit? So we effectively called it the spirit. Um, the spirit of Daniels. <laughs> Jack Daniels, I forgot about that, but it's it's a nickname. Um, oh man. I, I, well, we also got old granddad. We can sit and spend time with old granddad, the, the spirit of Daniels or, or my friend Jack, as I like to call him. It, it, there's a, we can, we can appreciate a wild Irish rose every now and then. Well, and I'll be honest. Um, I'm not a beer guy. If I'm going to drink, I'm going to do something that's going to do the job quickly. So whiskey, but in general, Outside of holidays, not very common for me. Um, but yeah, the, you know the the whole drinking thing. Do you have to drink? No. Um, but it it's a thing. People do it, and there's there's no issue with it as long as you control the drink. The drink doesn't control you. Um, there there's even lore about you know how it's shameful to get sloppy drunk. It's good to it's okay to drink, but just don't get sloppy drunk. Which is, again, my recommendation because you stop having fun once you start getting sick or start being overly belligerent. So as long as you can maintain control of yourself. But it does have the odd side effect of it even makes me sound like I can play and sing really well. I wonder why. I can't quite figure it out. Well, that's one of the beautiful things is... it. As they say, the spirits of alcohol allow you to see a bit deeper past the veil. And maybe maybe you're singing beautifully in spirit. <laughs> but um, 
and yeah, as a result, like you brought up how the uh, the apple trees, the cider apple trees were cut down. That's why there's almost no or no um, John, Johnny Appleseed trees left because they cut them all down. <laughs> and it's a really unfortunate situation. It's like um, there is this attitude of um, trying to trying to remove that American identity to push the multicultural idea. And America has always been multicultural in the sense of it has had many, many different American cultures. But the, like Paul Bunyan statues, there's still some. I mean, they've kept mostly the ugly ones, if I'm honest. But there's still some Paul Bunyan statues up around, but they've been tearing those down. Um, Johnny Appleseed, if anyone has watched the Disney version, I have to tell you this because it bugs me. Johnny Appleseed was not a twig. He was not a pacifist. And he was not a wimp. Dude could give Paul Bunyan a run for his money with logging. He was built. The dude was basically running around with wolves, bears, and rattlesnakes. He was he was uh, more of a wild man that, or a hermit than much else. I mean, the dude could literally uh, put rock, red-hot pokers and nails through his foot in no pain. Uh, he was a beast. He was, he was not a, a weakling by many means. Yeah, and that's where I was going to go with it with John with Johnny Appleseed is, um, yeah, uh, purportedly, he never wore shoes. So when you see an image of him and he's not wearing shoes, aces, it's correct. And apparently when he was in somebody's homestead, and by the way, the reason that he supposedly pl- went out west ahead of everybody and planted these apple seeds is the homesteading act of the time had something to do with um, there had to be so many fruiting trees on the property. So then to make it legal for people to go out west and, and homestead, he that's why supposedly one of the reasons, or according to some of the stories at least, that's why he went and did that. So, hey, bravo. But then um, when he'd be coming back through an area and there's somebody living there, apparently he would entertain the kids with driving needles and nails or or touching his, the bottoms of his feet with hot pokers. Well, and and he would, because he was a he was technically Christian, but he was Christian in the Swedenborgianism way. Now, if you haven't heard of Swedenborgianism, it is a really really weird version of Christianity. Um, it doesn't go full aliens like uh, Mormonism does. Um, but there is a spirit realm, which is a third realm. Um, he defined hell as. I don't really know how to describe it, but it was very different. It was basically, um, it was basically Gary, Indiana. Um, but not quite, but it was, it was your own horror, your own guilt, your own deeds or anything like that. It was projected onto you. It was, it was a whole thing. And then he had a spirit realm. And then the way he described heaven was eerily similar uh, to how halls are described because everybody kind of had their own area and then his quote-unquote angels had their own little halls that people could go to. It was interesting. Right, so basically the way they described hell is like most modern media depicts hell. They don't depict hell as a flaming pit. They depict hell, a lot of it depicts, depicts hell, hell as individual hells. Taylor fit to the individual where the worst moment of their life plays over and over again. Sometimes they don't know that they're dead. You guys have watched TV, so you can figure out what I'm talking about. And then, yeah, the, um, the heaven, it sounds like, um, the, the meadow of the ancestors or any variety of halls, realms, etc. that paganism has. And then he just called it Christianity, which is okay. It, I guess. Well, when Johnny Appleseed is described as being seen as a spirit or a uh, medicine man by the Amerindians Indians before he was even dead, because like typically, unless we're like God kinging somebody, our people tend to wait until they're at least dead before we start like overemphasizing them and mythicizing them. Um, I think Paul Bunyan, because there's some evidence there was actually a guy named Paul Bunyan. Um, interestingly enough, his name means swelling, which is very telling because his own size would... He was swole. 
Well, he would get bigger or smaller depending on how the story demanded it. Uh, you've even been shocked at like some of how big he's supposed to be. Yeah, see, I grew up where where we had the giant Paul Bunyan stat- statues, which were ridiculous, um, ridiculously big, and life size Paul Bunyan. And it's it's really really tall, but most of the stories have him bouncing back and f- average it out at nine feet, which is ridiculously big for a human. Um, but when is it a song i think it was a song might have been a little kids movie thing that we was watching about paul bunyan 63 axe handles high do you know how long or how high the act when they say something is an axe handle high that's three feet so 163 times three is what really big uh, just under uh, two, just under, just a, around 200 feet. I'm not going to try and do the math real quick there. But, um, and Paul Bunyan is by far the most popular uh, mythic figure of America. Um, there's other popular ones, like we've talked about um, Johnny Appleseed there. But Paul takes the cake. Uh, there, Everyone will argue over who... Where he's from. Because if you're from Maine, he's from Maine. And people will fight you on that. If you're from the UP, he is from the UP. And they will fight you on that. And if you're from the Pacific Northwest, then he's from the Pacific Northwest. You all don't know what you're talking about. And that's the whole thing with Paul Bunyan is there's not one specific spot. And everyone's going to claim that this is the homeland of Paul Bunyan. Like Minnesota really really pushes Paul Bunyan um they're actually the origin of a myth about Lucette who was a the best quilt maker and a giantess in in the land and she was uh, Paul Bunyan's sweetheart and eventual wife and I believe that there's stories about how he made because it is Minnesota the land of a thousand lakes yeah uh 10,000 lakes apologies um so 10,000 lakes so 10,000 or, you know, 9,000 mud puddles and 1,000 lakes. But, yeah, uh, uh, something about him tromping across the land. And I'm sure that there's a wide variety of stories to explain how Paul Bunyan created all these lakes. Yeah, and with Paul Bunyan, he created, what was it? It was the Grand Canyon. He created the Great Lakes sometimes. Uh, he created the Mississippi sometimes. He created the Missouri sometimes. Uh, he's credited with creating the Great Plains in the Dakotas. Um, uh, just on and on and on and on. And it's interesting because the way that it's described, and I actually made this comparison, is he's basically the personification of the Laurentian ice sheet. Because almost everything that he's credited with can basically be blamed on like that ice sheet. Well, and I also find it interesting that and a lot of local celebrations, Johnny Appleseed will work their way into it. Uh, a lot of the 4th of July celebrations, Johnny Appleseed will work his way into it. Paul Bunyan will work his way into it. I'm sure in the Southwest, Pecos Bill probably works his way into it. Um, out East, there might be some um, uh, storm along. Uh, some of the storm along might work his way into it. When the 4th of July, as, a, as an American holiday, is... It's about the independence of the nation. And yet, these other characters, these other people, these these demigods, whatever it is that you want to view them as, manage to work their way to the forefront in many, in, in many rural areas in particular. I haven't seen much evidence of it in urban areas, but in rural areas, yeah, they, they, they come to prominence again. Same with um, Betsy Ross. The, the lady that, that sewed the Betsy Ross flag, which I'm not sure that she even existed. She might have. If, if, if you know for a fact that she has, share that too. But I, I, I know that she's, her existence is in, in contention. Well, let's be honest. It doesn't fully matter. I mean, <laughs> they pretty much know she existed. The, the debate is on whether or not she sewed the flag. But the Betsy Ross house 
is essentially a sacred spot in American folklore and culture. And it's really telling that it is because last year during the riots, let's let's call them what they were. Um, they the tried very violent protests. Yes, the very very violent protests. Um, mostly peaceful, as some people have termed them. They tried to burn down the Betsy Ross house. If there hadn't been guards, they would have, because they trashed a lot of statues. Uh, they they trashed uh, frick. They took down deer statues in Portland, but it is this attempt to rid us of our culture. And to a certain extent, we're kind of helping because we are denying the unique American cultures that were here. And there's nothing wrong with embracing our European heritage. I often like I'm descended mostly from like German mountains and whatnot, so. I'll view the Alps and those things in an almost Arcadian fashion. And that's just how me as an American views it. Well, and really we're helping simply by not celebrating. It could, because it's a valid point that you brought up. They're, they're trying to take all the stuff away from us. They're trying to hide it from us. They're trying to change it. And in many ways we're helping. We're helping simply by not acknowledging it and not celebrating it. So we need to celebrate these things, even if it's on small scale. If nothing else, think of it as a, oh, struggling not to swear, uh, a middle finger up at the people that want to take these things from us. Celebrate them, hold on to them, remember that they're important. Well, and especially if you're someone who is lucky enough to have heritage from one of the more clearly cut uh, tribal groups. Let's go with that. You know, I brought up the Cajuns, Pennsylvania Dutch. There's all these New England groups. I won't even try to name them all. Uh, Appalachians. Uh, there's people that are very, very attached to their Southern heritage. Texas. Uh, people that you know moved west with the the Homestead Act. You know, who had, for lack of a better term, cowboys as ancestors. People that have settled this area, created this area, founded a town. You know, Halloween, um, Santa Claus. I know some people will, will dismiss Santa Claus, but he's the combination of many European traditions to make something uniquely American. And the same is true of Halloween. The same is true of Easter. The same is true of July 4th. There is value in the unique cultures we built here because they're a continuation of the European cultures, just like parts of France. Uh, there's England, the Netherlands, Austria, uh, Germany, the Scandinavian countries are all what people would term extensions of the Germanic tribes. Uh, extension, other areas are extensions of the Celtic tribes, the Slavic tribes, the Baltic tribes, the Finno-Ugric tribes. And that when they came over here, they continued those and they morphed and they became something unique. And I think that's beautiful. Right, and... Um I was just thinking. Uh, I was thinking to myself a little, a little while ago, and I'm sure everybody noticed it. I was so proud of us because we've been working so hard on improving our our production quality. We've gotten to sound better a little bit, um, in part thanks to the the support of, of our supporters. We managed to get a little bit more extra gear, um, and. Yeah, I was, um, and then I'm sure everybody noticed the, the new intro, which we're going to do a few of those, you know, just to have fun, just to have fun. But then I opened up the squealing door of death a few minutes ago. There went all the production value. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's just a thing. So I'm kind of kicking myself in the tail for that one. But, yeah, we're trying to make the show better. Uh, we're almost out of time. That's why I'm kind of shifting over in, in this direction. But, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing what we can to increase our production value. We're still putting out posts on Telegram, so make sure to follow us there. We're going, we have a link tree, so we'll, we'll try to at least get the, remember to put the link tree in the description so you can chase us around there. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me see telegram for for various posts and updates we have a website wilderhomesproject.life on there we got bigger blogs 
for more information of a variety of stuff there's lore there there's and, and it's just going to open up but there's things on there of customs like flitting um some information and there's going to be more of that going up um uh, like why are worms important why should we pay any attention to worms and then we have the theater page which we're hoping you know it it's a small but dedicated group of us and we're working on getting all these things together we're working on a whole bunch of stuff at once and i'm proud of what we've managed to do so far and i'm, I'm glad everybody's come along with us this far and if you ha if this is your first time listening to us we're hoping that you continue on with us and i was going to say oh yeah i remember i was going to ask the people out in the audience so if you know lore keeper please don't say but it's just like a homework assignment, and I don't even know if there's an answer because I am not going to look this up. But it was just an idle thought that I was having earlier today when I was walking around. There's mulberries everywhere here. Does anybody in the audience, can you let us know in the combat uh, in the comment section, what deities are associated with mulberries? Because they, they fruit apparently for months, and I know that there's things like uh, mulberry jam and juice and wine and etc 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 because what do you do when you got this many mulberries you can't keep them all year round but does anybody out there know of a deity or spirit directly associated with the mulberries and yeah so i'm gonna shoot out of here and i'm just gonna remind everybody you know be brave keep it up i'm gonna fight back the desire to sing the uh weasel around the mulberry bush song <laughs> um and say, I just hope everybody has a good 4th of July, a good weekend, a good summer, and that everyone's able to enjoy it. And um, we can hear the fireworks going on, who knows how far away, but we can hear them through the door. And I hope everybody just enjoys it and embrace it. Embrace whether you're European, whether you're American, whether you're Cajun or Flemish or Greek or anything just embrace who you are and be proud of it and with that the lore keeper is going to sign off and everybody out there on the wasteland be great